Okay. Anyway, we'll just get started. All right. Uh, okay, so this is a pretty quick thing. I only got like 20 minutes. Um, so I have points, but I'm more interested in the conversation if you guys want to talk. So uh, just a quick background about me, uh, Tyler Lieutenant Colonel, uh, uh, went defense contractor when I first came out, uh, didn't like it at all, wanted to get out of it. It was difficult. I found my way out. Um, and now I, I work straight commercial work um, as a director for security and infrastructure where I'm at. Um, and I work for a, uh, it's a, it's a nonprofit, but not like you might think. It's a uh, very well-funded nonprofit that supports the uh, motion picture industries. Um, and we do benefits continuity for all the people behind the scenes in the movies, like uh, your grips, your gappers, those kind of folks. When they, when they do union work and they move from place to place, um, they maintain their benefits by being, uh, by all their contributions coming to us. And so because they change companies so often, this is how their unions maintain benefits. And so that's where I work. Um, and so since we're supported by the movie industry, we're a very well funded nonprofit, um, which is a good place to be, let me tell you. Um, so anyway. But uh, who do I have here with me today? Uh, we have we have veterans in here. All right, good. Okay, I got four. We got people trying to. You guys trying to get? Are you in DoD stuff now? and You want to get out? That's the goal. Okay. Uh, how about yourself? What's your? Okay, yeah. All right. Okay, so um, I mean, I, I have my points here, but so the first thing I want to talk about is why do you want to leave government service behind? Right? There's 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 reasons that'll work out for you, and there's reasons that won't. Okay. Um, personally, I was just done with supporting the DOD. I just, I kind of had enough. Uh, I did my time, 20 years. Um, uh, I'd come back to do defense contract work because I needed a job when I got out of the military and it was easy to do, right? Easy, easier to get a job. We can talk about that in a second though. Um, in the military industrial complex than it was not to. But um, uh, but there are some reasons that are like bad to leave. Like someone give me a reason why you want to get out of DOD or government service. Like, like go ahead. What's red tape? Okay. So, there's bureaucracy out in the, in, the, in, the, in the commercial world, man, right? All right, it's not going to go away, okay? So make sure you know that, right? It, it's, it, um, there's plenty of red tape in the military and the government complex, absolutely. But when you get to your company, depending how big it is or depending what size it is, you're not going to escape that, okay? So um, so that's just a reason to, you know, don't, don't run away from the problems you have in the government, uh, government work, work with like bureaucracy, with like bad management, uh, that kind of stuff. It, it, the, the commercial world's not any better. Uh, it just depends where you're at. And if you get lucky, you meet the good managers, you meet good folks. Yeah, you can do great. Um, uh, if you were just looking for a different purpose to your life or do something different, that's the best reason to leave, okay? Uh, not to avoid things that are bad in organizations. And I'm just trying to be truthful up here, okay? So just keep that in mind as you're trying to leave. Um, what else did I have in here? Um, I had some other stuff on here, like uh, like... Like moving, like maybe you're tired of moving. Uh, like if you're active duty military, you move a lot. Um, and maybe you're tired of that. And you can absolutely find a physical location that you want to plant yourself in, but you may not promote the way you think you will if you don't want to move. Okay, so these are just some truths of the commercial world. You can stay put 100%. But uh, if you're in a big company, like, I don't know, like, a, like Ford Motor Company or something like that, their executive team moves every two to three years. All the time, I've I've met some. I know them. Uh, they they they're they're always being moved because they want them just like the military to ex experience all kinds of different parts of the company so that they're they're ready to lead when they get to that point in their life. So um, so you may not escape moving, um, and so you know, for me the best reason to leave the military or government stuff is that you're just done working in that career field. You you want to try something different. Okay, that's the mental state you have to have because you're going to have a lot of the same problems that exist in the military uh, and in government service of, of bad management, of, of, bo of, of bosses that are like, like overly demanding or, or, or denigrate you or make fun of it. It, like, it doesn't change. That stuff exists across the world, uh, across all the, all the industries. So, so one thing I want you to consider is why you want to leave. So make sure you think about that. Um, let's see. Um, who here thinks you're going to get amazing pay as soon as you leave the military? Do you guys have that that myth that that thing that happens that everyone thinks it's going to happen that when you leave government service, especially if you're an enlisted individual um, in the early part of your career, you may think you're going to pop out and you're making 25k, 30k a year. You're going to make six figures immediately. It's not that simple. Okay, it can happen. It does happen, but it can be very difficult um, to find that money, and it's almost certainly going to be as a defense contractor. Um, if you're going to go straight commercial out of uh, like a four to six year enlisted career you're not going to end up uh, in the high pay bands right away. Um, you can get there, absolutely, but you need to be prepared. It's not going to be like this, oh, I walk out, next day I'm making six figures. Unless you're going to trade on your, your clearances, 
uh, and your tech skills they taught you. Like for example, at lunch, the lady there was a uh, sonar tech and she didn't want to do sonar tech when she got out. Um, and so she absolutely could have gone to work for Lockheed and BAE and all these companies that build sonar. And she probably could have made pretty decent money. She probably could have done expatriate work, like doing sonar support in the Persian Gulf and made a ton of money. Uh, but uh, it was, that's the only way she could have made that money. Uh, when she wanted to jump into cybersecurity, it's a much harder road to go to, uh, to change your, sk your skill set, your career set. You're leaving as a senior officer. Um, there's a chance you may get into some good stuff, but I'm here to tell you that I watched many of my peers. I was the first of my peer group to kind of retire. Uh, I watched many of my peers um, struggle on LinkedIn. And then their first job posting out of military service is, a, is, a, is basically a, a frontline junior engineer at a, at a company. Now, these are typically defense contractor jobs, so they pay well, uh, but it's, it's basically an entry-level job. Um, and so uh, you have to be prepared for that kind of stuff to, 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 to move along. You either trade on your, your military career and service in order to get a high-paying job or be prepared to take a step back. Um, for instance, when I got out, I really, really got into uh, red teaming stuff. I got my OSCP. Uh, you guys all know what that is? Okay. I got my OSCP, and it was great. I was like, this is great. I want to go do this. Man, oh, man. There was no way I was going to get the pay level I needed to support my family, especially living in Los Angeles, because that was a choice my family made um, that was going to allow me to do that job uh, as a red teamer. It wasn't going to work. And so um, I ended up getting some you know, managerial blue team job. I told you I'm a director. Um, and it did work out fine. I found blue team to be actually quite, um, uh, quite energizing and staying ahead of things and keeping things moving as long as you're in the right company. Okay. So that actually leads me into my next point about when you want to move away from government work, you need to pick the mission. You need, to, or, or not pick a mission specifically, but you need to believe in the mission of the commercial company that you're going to go work for. Okay, because they're going to demand a lot of you, uh, the, the, especially as IT, especially as security, and you need to know that you're doing something you like. For instance, I'm protecting the healthcare records and pension data for all these guys, that, that, all these folks, pardon me, that are in the military. Uh, sorry, in the in the motion picture industry, all these carpenters, that kind of stuff. Uh, that, that's what I'm protecting. And I find that a, a satisfying mission. Um, you know, like when I, when I was first coming out, we living in Florida when, when I retired and we were going to come to LA. That's where my wife's family is. And so we we're coming here and I'm like, okay, I'm going to LA, LA, Hollywood. I'm like, man, I don't know about working in Hollywood. I was just, all I could think about was, uh, sex, drugs, and rock and roll. I was like, I was like, I was like, is this going to appeal to me as an individual leaving a, uh, you know, a very formal environment? Um, uh, especially as personally, I ran a pretty formal shop as a leader in the military because that's what we're expected of us as, as leaders in the military. Keep the standards high. Um, and, you know, in the last few years of my career, we, you know, it was all during like the huge push against sexual harassment and sexual assault in the military. And so standards were, were raising and I didn't want to go back. I didn't want to go back to a world where that was what was being um, kind of defeated and honored. And so I was really worried about it. Um, and, you know, then I, so I got this defense contractor job. And so I was in the kind of same environment, which is fine. Uh, but then I started like doing recruiting for that company. And so we go to these fairs. And so there'd be my line. I worked for MITRE at the time. My line, like, hey, MITRE guy. And next to me was Tinder. And Tinder had a line out the door for people that wanted to work for them. <laughs> and nobody wanted to come work for MITRE. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> <That was cool. laughs> Um, and, and so I was doing some gut checking because Tinder hires security people like crazy. And I was like, and I was like, is that what I want to do? Is this a mission that appeals to me? And it turns out, no, I'm not into that mission. Even though my wife and I met online, uh, 17 years ago, it wasn't the same kind of meeting online that it is now. Uh, especially, especially Tinder culture. It wasn't swipe culture back then. Um, and so I, it didn't appeal to me. So I had to avoid those things. I had to avoid, I started looking at, um, Oh geez, what's the uh, the League of Legends guys? Uh, the, um, the the big company here. Dang it. Right. What's that? Right. Yeah. Yes. Riot Games. So I, I started looking at Riot Games, and this is before they had their articles that came out about the the, the toxic the toxic nature of their culture. Um, but I was reading through the job ads, and it was like, we want people to take their pentakills as seriously as they take their you know as their work. And I was like, eh, uh, you know, my favorite game is a CTF. I like to do like stuff like that. I don't. I don't get joy out of video games anymore. I used to, it's not my thing. So I'm just saying, be very careful about the mission you want to accept. Because as a person who has served in the military, uh, served in government, you served a mission, a bigger mission. You're used to that. Um, and it may be hard to contract yourself into something that actually feels pretty small to you when you finally get into it. You might be getting paid well. You might have a lot of fun. There might be interesting perks. But if that mission doesn't ring your bell, you're probably not going to like the job long term. So just keep that in mind.
Comments or questions on that? Okay. All right. So how do I prepare to jump? Um, so around like the 17 year point, 18 year point, I knew I was getting out at 20. There was no 06 jobs I wanted. I didn't, not a single one appealed to me. So I was like, it's time for me to leave. Um, and so I started with something that's actually a little bit unpopular right now. I started with certifications. Um, and I'm here to tell you, like, there's a lot of noise about certs, like, especially if you follow the B-side circuit with, uh, with Whiskey Jack, Daniel, you'll be like, like, you know, he's, he's the most anti-CISSP guy you can possibly meet. I'm here to tell you, stuff all that stuff in a closet and get your goddamn cert. All right, get them all. Get all the ones you can afford to and go get on your own and don't wait for them because the person who's going to get that job has the cert. You want to make a principled stance against certain certs, wait till you're a hiring authority and change the hiring practices for your company. Okay? You can't do it as a as an entrant employee. The job I have now I would never would have gotten without my CISSP. I wouldn't even made it past the first phone call with HR. Um, and that's just the fact of the matter in our world. Uh, the, uh, the civilian world demands certifications. And if you don't get them, you're just fighting a system that you cannot win. Now, might you be at an event like this and you meet a person and you trade cards and, and you end up getting hired from that? Of course, but it's a low probability play, okay? So get your certs, get your stuff together. Um, the next thing I did to prepare myself is uh, I decided, hey, I'm gonna make a hack. I'm gonna submit it to DEF CON. And guess what? I had never been to DEF CON and I built a hack and my very first time at DEF CON was as a speaker. Okay, so now that's not normal. <laughs> it doesn't happen very often. And in fact, I haven't had much success since then getting into DEF CON as a speaker. I spoke this past year at, in the demo, demo labs, but I didn't get main stage. Um, these are things you need to do to set yourself apart. So don't, don't aim at DEF CON, aim at B-Sides uh, uh, Vegas, aim at, aim at Shell CON, aim at uh, B-Sides San Francisco. There's tons of things you can aim at, but find something you're interested in, write a paper on it, submit it, and then eventually come up and talk. Um, it's Whether you get a job that way or not, or any notoriety that way, it is a great piece of fodder for your interview cycle. And, uh, and anyone who knows anything in the business will be like, you spoke at a conference? So it, it rings their bell whether, they, whether they've even been to those conferences or not. They know that it's amazing that you have spoken. So they will, uh, so it just helps. It's a nice little thing to put at the bottom of your resume. Hey, relevant things. I also do stuff like publish in 2600, blog posts, anything you can do, LinkedIn articles, just to get your name. You need to do it. Um, and actually, and whether you think it's like showboating or like thought leadership, which can be a negative term on certain uh, circles these days or not, it actually helps you refine your ideas and techniques and things that you're interested in. Um, and I've learned a lot just by trying to speak. And then you meet people and you have great conversations with folks. So I really recommend attempting that. If you haven't put in for a paper to talk, do it. There's no downside. Um, a lot of times you get good feedback if you ask for it specifically. Uh, even in DEF CON, if you like specifically hit Nikita up and be like, hey, why not? You'll get something back from her, even though she's busy as hell. So uh, you can learn a lot that way. Um, and if you've been to some of these conferences, you'll find that they are in general a mix of, of stuff that, is like so simple you don't understand why they're talking about it at a conference and completely incomprehensible, right? So you fit in there somewhere. I'm here to tell you, you'll fit in there. Like I've gone to Black Hat and seen talks on phishing and, and USB keys being left in parking lots. I'm like, we're still talking about that at Black Hat? Are you kidding me? But they are. So uh, never feel never feel negative about anything you want to do. and But make sure it's something you're interested in because then it'll be a, a good talk and you'll actually learn a lot and have fun. All right. Question on talks or applying to conferences or anything like that. Yes. The more data you can provide, the absolute better. So um, my first talk, the one I did at DEF CON, was um, I had I written a white paper. I had a working, everything worked. Like everything was done. All I did was finally just submit it when the, when the window opened. And always it's best to submit early because uh, like um, Derby used to submit their stats. would be like, okay, this is the trickle of Derby stuff. And then two days before CFP closed, whoop. And so, it, but everything that was early, it, it got read. It had already been seen. So you're already in their mind. So I always say submit early. Um, and uh, and then write detailed white papers about it. Like, like there's always a minimum thing that you have to fill out to submit. It'd be like, oh, give us an outline. Uh, and any, you know, there'll always be like anything else you want to add. Man, link stuff. Like link your GitHub, link your, Link your, uh, like show that it's a working product and you can do it. I actually got away with it this past year where I, my, my stuff was barely working when I submitted. And it ended up being a much different talk when I finally got to the end. 
but um, but I got away with it uh, because now when I submit for talks, I can say uh, they'll say, "Hey, link to talks you've given," and I've got like I don't know four or five online now, um, and so you can do that, and so you get a little little bump. Uh, I didn't catch it. You're saying it was by the time before your presentation, your GitHub, whatever the product you were building did not work. Is that what you're saying? When when I submitted the CFP, the 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 idea was solid, but the working code was not. So I don't think I even had published it on GitHub yet. I didn't push it to GitHub until um, it was working, and I had and I made a bunch of uh, how tos and that kind of stuff. Um, but uh, but the idea was at least attractive enough that they let me talk with a, a frankly fairly unfinished uh, present um, idea when I submitted. So I kind of got away with it. But but my first one, main stage DevCon, was a fully fleshed out thing, fully working. Uh, I sent working code, working everything out to the CFP folks, and I mean I was in. So. Um, but uh, don't necessarily wait till the very last minute to do that kind of stuff. Uh, that's why I need something passionate. It took me two years to build that DEF CON hack. It took me a year to build the one I just briefed last year. You have to be into it, right? So don't just pick something you're not cool with just because you want to talk about it. You want to talk. Like, hey, I want to work on that. I really want to get good at it. And then you would make a great talk. All right, I'm running out of time, I believe. Um, let's see, resume. They've had all kinds of resume viewers here. I'm just going to go over, like, demilitarize it as much as possible. Since I applied for management positions when I got out, um, I had like, like lieutenant, spatial experiments, captain, you know, I, 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 all this kind of crap. Yeah, yeah, I had all this stuff, and I was like, I, I broke it down. I said, I said, junior management, middle management, senior management, and I put in like the big, big picture items in there. Okay, um, and so that resume is the one that got me my job, and that, but resumes aren't enough. Like everybody else, I had black hole resumes everywhere, like just gone. Like you said, you're going to visit JPL, JPL, black hole. No response. This job that I got is the only resume where I, I literally hunted down the head of HR and called her uh, after I sent my resume in. It's like, did you get my resume? I'm like, just full on cocky BS. Just like, hey, you know, and I didn't have them talking to her. I ended up talking to like a junior HR person. But the point is, I would never gotten that phone call if I hadn't even followed up. So if it's a job you really want or uh, follow up, like find the, it's not hard to ever throw it. Everyone's on LinkedIn. And once they're on LinkedIn, then you just call the company switchboard and ask for them by name and use your social engineering skills. It doesn't, it's not hard. <laughs> get in touch with the people that make the decisions. Um, at least get you through the door. I always knew if I could interview, I would probably get hired, but I could not get an interview. Tons of black hole, black hole resumes over and over again before I was out. Um, and then when I was actually out, I didn't like MITRE and I wanted to get out of MITRE. Black hole, black hole, black hole. You have to follow up. Simple as that. Um, let's see. I forgot the book I was going to bring. I have a book called Rites of Passage. Um, it's a, and if you look at it, it's called Rites of Passage, like how to get that six-figure plus job or whatever. It's about executive job hunting. Um, and it's a little bit corny and cheesy in some of its writing, but it has some really good suggestions on interview techniques. Um, and I really meant to bring it. I apologize. Um, and it's like, you should have a 60-second answer to every question that is asked. And that's really about it, 60 seconds. You shouldn't just be babbling on and on. You should have your set thing of, of, of what you did or what the problem was, what you did, and how it improved the problem that existed. One of the problems we have, one of the biggest problems we have about leaving DOD and government service into, into a for-profit industry is that we have no record of showing we can handle a for-profit world. We, I, can't, I can't show you anything, oh, I increased revenue by 80%. I can't do it. So you have to talk about problem solving. We need tons of that in the military. That's, that's our every day. So make sure you sell that stuff. So... So practice those stories, write them down, get that book. It has like, it has like a, yes, that's the one. And, and I will warn you, like there's some corny stuff in there, man. I'm not going to lie, but, but the stuff I'm interviewing is great. And there's a whole section on dealing with uh, corporate recruiters, which was my extremely educational. There is a lot to learn about how to deal with recruiters correctly. So you don't get screwed. Um, and so I highly recommend reading it for those purposes alone. Um, let's see, I talked about recruiters. Uh, branding. Oh, I jumped ahead. I did a branding already, which is basically speaking at conferences. Um, uh, you need to have something that sets you apart from the from the field. Um, the big joke, of course, on hiring into security is everyone wants an entry level person, but they want six years of experience, right? Um, it's extremely weird, and 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 uh, and you know, even as a hiring authority now, I find myself writing the same things. These like one of my guys leaves, and since I'm a kind of small shop, he did all this, and I want to hire for all that, but my company won't pay for all that, and so. So then how do I do it? But having these things on your resume, set yourself apart. And even it's just like, oh, my security blog with a thousand followers, whatever, just anything to show that you are trying 
to learn the most and, and get your get word out there. Your personal brand is important to get through the door for a hiring authority. All right. Any questions on any of that stuff? Comments? Anybody want to talk about anything in particular? All right. Are we just one example of a special process where Let's see. Well, unfortunately I haven't um interviewed in like three years now. So 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 now you're catching me flat footed. But um I think so I was a commander, squadron commander, uh and and I had this unit and it was a pretty small unit. Um and then there was a sister unit that was three times my size. Um and then by the time I was done with my little unit, we were producing five times what that unit did. That's the kind of story that resonates, even with a for profit individual. I didn't increase the size of my company or the size of my team. I used them better. And uh and we were setting the standards uh for it. Um so that's the kind of thing you're talking about. So any kind of project like that, anything where you cut man hours or efficiency, or if you're going into a uh, into a compliance company or a compliance job, um, well, so I mean, I don't know how many of you have survived Inspector General uh, things, but that's what those are, right? The Inspector General uh, audits, inspections, it's a compliance inspection. And so you can talk about well, if you led any compliance work about how you did it and how you survived, you know, and we got, you know, an excellent and a three day pass, you know, you just um, all those kinds of things that you can, you can bring up. But your, your record's full of it. Uh, full of good information about things that you did uh, and make sure that you uh, learn to talk about them. Um, and I don't know how it is, even amongst the officer world, uh, like sometimes they make edits to your OPR before it's signed and things get on there that you didn't actually do. Um, don't talk about those things. Don't take credit for them. I, I Don't ever lie on your resume. Uh, it takes about three and a half seconds to catch a person lying on their resume and it's the first thing we do when you come into my office. Is uh, like I had a guy who came in and said he knew how to use Metasploit. I was like, oh, okay, well, uh, what's the console look like? He's like, well, you know, it's it's got letters and stuff. You're like, you're, you're like, you're like, oh, cool, all right. Yeah, I think he even said he used Armitage. I was like, oh, well, like you know, how do you attach to a host? He's like, well, you know, menu. What's the menu say? Uh, yeah. Anyway, it doesn't take long, so don't take credit for things you don't have. Um, I will say something about resumes is. In our career, especially IT, we all we tend to learn things and then move on, and then we don't remember how to use them, right? I list those as latent skills. I don't want to. I don't want to ignore them. I want people to know that I have done it. But I literally say latent skills. It's like like I've done this in the past. I can do it again. But if you ask me to do it like live right now, I'm probably going to fail. It's going to take me a few hours, right? So I think it's there's a lot of value in that. Like, I mean, I've written in I don't know a half dozen languages, but the only one I use right now is Python. If you if you throw me into a C C plus plus thing, um, I, I've done it absolutely. I wrote an entire app for the iPhone in C plus uh, plus, um, but I don't really remember it all that well. And anything complicated like a recursive tree search, I'm not going to get that question right. I, I'm just not. So I listed as latent skills. Uh, so something you can keep in mind. Um, I want to talk a little bit about what it's like being a military person going to a straight commercial world. About what kind of weird things to expect. Um, and it's probably not the same for everybody. Everyone's experience are different. Um, but do you know how hard it is to get a, a vanilla commercial person just to show up on time for work every morning? It's really hard. It can be, I got five minutes, okay. Um, so just showing up, keeping your task list, getting them done and turning them in is enough to get you noticed, all right? So, and then if you take that extra step and you start doing some initiative, you're really gonna stand out. So you bring a lot to the team. You bring a lot of responsibility and personable accountability that other folks don't have and don't undersell yourself on that stuff. And, and you know, and that's your brand as well. Like you're always there, you're always getting the work done, you're doing it quick, and then things will grow from there. Um, leaders uh, in the mil uh, in the non-military, I have found um, with my uh, my background, uh, especially since I was in the Pentagon for four years, that my ability to work organizational processes, I can run rings around all my all my commercial counterparts. Um, all that red tape and stuff that you don't like about the military has taught you how to deal with it in ways that they don't know how to work, they don't know how to deal with. Use that um, and, and you'll get things done and people will be amazed. Uh, my two security engineers that work for me now, they, within, um, I don't know, six months of me being there, they're like, they're like, we've never seen so much money being given to our department before. Like, how are you doing it? It's like, well, I just, I, I build my thing. It's like, like, no, like you're like the third person who's worked here and none of, you can't get the money. And I'm like, well, these are the skills you learn, like especially in the Pentagon, right? It's all very cutthroat. Um, if any enlisted leaders or even uh, officer leaders in here, I discovered that my concern for individuals' well-being, um, like to the point of asking them a lot of personal questions, was a little off-putting to, to the straight-up civilians at first. They're not used to it. 
um, than I used to people actually legitimately caring. You know, I, when I ask those questions, I ask from a position of absolute care. I, I legitimately care. That's why my units did good. That's why the airmen that work for me did good. That's why people that work with me do well is because I legitimately care about them as people. That's rare. Use it. Um, and if they're off, they're put off by it at first, eventually they'll stop being put off by it as long as it's coming from a position of real care and not just gossip nosiness, right? So um, like one of the things that specifically is that if a person doesn't show up for work on time and I always ask, hey, I'll be asked, hey, is everything okay? Um, they think they need to defend themselves, but why didn't show up on time? I'm like, no, you don't get it. Like, are you okay as a person? Is everything okay in your life? We'll deal with the fact you didn't show up on time in a little bit, but let's get over this, this issue with whatever's going on in your life, right? So just uh, be aware that that may put, them, put people off, but I found that they respond to it. Um, and so let me see, let me, I had some just final statements here. So my advice for first time security professionals if you're going to security as a whole is fearless curiosity and self-directed research, never stop. Find things you don't understand and learn them every day. Uh, and don't be afraid. Um, as a whole, managers expect security pros to be versatile, curious, and dogged in the search of answers. If I ask you a question as your boss, don't come to me with questions. Like research the hell of that thing until you're stuck and then come back and say, well, here's everything I've tried, I can't get to work, what next? But don't just be like, what now, what now, what now? It doesn't work in the security field. Um, let's see. Uh, the only, <laughs> the only uh, caveat to that is if you are a security analyst and you think you've detected a breach, do not keep that information to yourself. <laughs> like, even if you're not 100% sure, that information does not age well under any circumstance. So make sure you bring it up. And my last piece of advice to a security professional, learn how to use Excel. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. You use Excel a lot no matter what. All right, I think I'm done, but any quick questions for me? Anybody? I'll be hanging around for a little bit. Uh, around you, if you can't find me, I'm probably on the competition floor, trying to learn. Um, and so uh, I've got this backpack, easiest way to recognize me. Um, and there you go. Thanks, guys. I appreciate it.